Good morning, boys and girls. Today we are going to be reading a story called Someday a Tree. And before we read, I want you to think about maybe a special place you like to visit. So as a kid, I grew up by a creek. Okay, we live right by the golf course, so my neighbors and I would go over there, we would hang out, we would um, catch golf balls that had been hit into the woods, and we just had a really good time just relaxing and hanging out and telling stories and just playing together. Okay, so I want you to think about maybe a place that you go that is relaxing and you spend quality time with someone okay because what we're going to do with this story is we are going to make connections and the character in this story has a special place and maybe you can even make a prediction looking in or looking at the cover where that special place might be but something happens to this special place and we're going to make a connection um, to the character as we read how we would feel if maybe something happened to our special place so this is Someday a Tree by Eve Bunting. <clears throat> Every afternoon when the weather's nice, Mom and I and our sheepdog Cinco walk across far, far meadow and sit under our oak tree. Dad says the tree may have been here when Columbus came to America. Mom and I bring lemonade, our pockets full of small tart apples, and I gather acorns for my collection. Always we bring biscuits for Cinco and a book for us. Once upon a time in a land far away, Mom begins. Cinco lays his head on his paws and listens too. Or Mom and I tell stories. Tell how just before he was born, you and Dad stopped here one day to picnic under the tree and you saw that land and the house were for sale? I stopped for breath. And we were tired of living in the city, and we bought them. Mom finishes. Tell how it was christened under the tree, I say. Tell how a bird did you know what on the reverend's head, and Mrs. McInerney, Mc, McInerney wore a hat with real flowers on it. And the bees came. We roll on the grass laughing, and Cinco rolls and laughs too. So it sounds like these characters spend a lot, a lot of quality time here. On hot days, people driving from city to city often stop to picnic on the way Mom and Dad did. We don't mind. Dad says the tree isn't ours anyway because no one can own a tree. The people spread their blankets and pretend not to be listening to our stories, but sometimes we see them smile. Today, I am doing my favorite thing. I'm lying under our tree, staring up to the leaves. Mom and Cinco are asleep beside me. The clouds change like smoke and the leaves whisper to them as they pass. I think I hear them whisper my name too. Alice, Alice. Above my head a spider sways. Somewhere an owl lives hidden. Sometimes when the dust thickens we hear him call and see his pale shadow. I turn on my stomach and bury my face in the grass. Why does it smell so funny? I sniff. Mom, I sit up. Mom, her eyes open. How come the grass smells like this, I ask. Why is this weird, or why is it this weird yellow color? Mom yawns. I expect it's because it's been so hot. We bring Dad to look. There's supposed to be rain tonight, he said. That's probably all the grass needs. Hmm, something's changing, it seems. But the rain doesn't help. Every day that yellow stain spreads. The grass around the tree is withering. We peer up into the leaves. They are dry and dull and drift down up on our upturned faces. It's only spring, but the leaves are falling. Mom puts her hand on the trunk as though checking for a fever. Dad kicks at the stiff grass. It's as if something was spilled here, he says. I think we need to call a tree doctor. When the tree doctor comes, she crumples one of the fallen leaves and scoops a sample of dirt from around the trunk. Is the tree very sick? I whisper. She touches my cheek. I need to run some tests before I'll know for sure. Keep thinking good thoughts, honey. Four days later, we found out that our tree has been poisoned. But who would do a thing like that? Mom cries. Dad's face is grim. 
Maybe someone dumped chemicals they weren't supposed to dump. Maybe it was quicker and easier to unload their stuff here by the road. I don't understand about chemicals, but I know this is bad. The word about our tree gets around. There's even a picture of it in the newspaper. When mom and dad and I start to dig the poison dirt from around the trunk, the McInerneys from down the road come to help. They brought spades and they work with us packing in fresh soil. We hadn't even asked. The fire department sends tanker trucks to spray water on the faded leaves. By now the top branches are bare and, da and dad and Mr. McNearney and Mr. Rodriguez climb up and wrap them in, sa in sacking to save them from the sun. So boys and girls, they're not just going to let this tree die right in front of them, are they? They're ta definitely taking steps <clears throat> to help save it. So if you look back here, if we go back, okay, they find out that the tree's been poisoned and as soon as people hear, they bring down fresh soil to maybe see if that will help against the chemicals. And then the fire department brings their trucks to spray water on it. Okay, let's see if they do anything else to try to save it. Mrs. Jackson, who works for the telephone company, borrows poles that are as tall as our tree. She and her friends put them up and hang sunscreens between them so our tree is always in the shade. They hope with us. Boys and girls, everyone is trying to save this tree. But the leaves keep falling. Rain has helped to soak the poison in, the tree doctor says. I don't think your tree has the strength left to fight. A woman comes with the red scarf she has knitted. It's, a lo it's as long as a jump rope. She ties it around the trunk and pats it in place. There, she says, it never hurts to muffle up. There are get well cards lined on the grass. A balloon shaped like a heart floats from a branch. Someone has brought a bunch of blue bonnets in a jelly jar and a can of chicken soup. So boys and girls, maybe you can make a connection to how people treat you when you're sick or maybe something has happened to you or your family and people in your community rally around you and help you. So those are all connections that you can make to what this character is seeing and feeling. But still, the leaves fall. The birds have gone, the squirrels too. Deer used to come at night, tiptoeing down from their secret places. They don't come anymore and the dusk is filled with silence. Is our tree dying? I asked dad. Is that why the birds and the animals have gone? The noise around here has spooked them, that's all, said Dad. I want to believe him, but I'm scared. Cinco won't go close to the tree now either. Each night I watch from my window for the deer. If the deer come back, but they don't. One night I'm so unhappy I go to Mom and Dad's room. Their door is open. They don't see me. My mom is crying. Dad has his arms around her. A tree lives and a tree dies, Mom says, but not like this. Dad strokes her hair. Shh, sweetheart. The person who did it probably didn't mean to kill the tree. We never mean to kill the beauty in the world. We just do. So have you ever lost something that makes you cry like that? It's a connection to how the characters are feeling. <clears throat> I slip away to lie on my bed. My chest hurts so bad. I thought our tree would always be here, like the sky, like the fields, like my mom and dad. I was wrong. Moonlight whitens my room and I see the big jar of acorns on my dresser. My collection. Some are old, but the ones on top I gathered just a little while ago when the tree was well. I'm so excited I can hardly breathe. I leap out of bed and take the acorns on top. I curl In the curl of my hand, they seem to be beating, bursting with tree life. I run to the window. I go now, but it's dark when the moon slides behind the clouds and the outside dark still scares me. I sleep with the acorns in my hands and I'm still clutching them, warm, damp in the morning. I race barefoot downstairs. Cinco is on the porch. He lifts a sleepy head, watches while I get mom's trowel and place it, paces behind me as I run across far meadow. It has rained again in the night. The air smells of it. Wet grass and shreds of Indian paintbrush cling to my pajamas. 
The dead leaves from our tree have been raked into piles, but others have fallen in the night. I rustle through them. Cinco hangs back. The tree seems to have shrunk. The top sack, sacking hangs like wet rags. The red scarf, long as a jump rope, is loose. Mrs. Jackson took the borrowed poles back a week ago. The tree has given up. So have we. I hold the acorns toward it on the... I hold the acorns toward it on the flat of my hand. I don't know, tree, I say, but maybe. Cinco helps me pace off giant steps till I'm sure we're on healthy ground. He helps me dig a little trench. I drop the acorns in one by one and cover them up. Don't you go making plans to come back and dig here again, I tell Cinco. If even one of these grows, we'll have a tree big as this. I spread my arms and stand tall. Bigger even. Cinco cocks his head. I don't know when, I answer. Someday. <clears throat> I stop at the tree to retie the red scarf and pat it the way the woman did. There you go, I say. It's strange. There are hardly any leaves left on the tree. But as Cinco and I are running back to the house, I think I hear a rustle behind us. I think I hear a whisper. Alice. Alice. So, boys and girls, this tree, this place was so important to not only our characters, but the people who love and care about them. So I want you to think of a place or even something that's special to you and how you would feel if you were going to lose it or how you would feel or how you felt if there is something in your life that you've lost that's been important to you. So I hope you enjoyed this story. You're going to use it this week to make your connections on Wednesday. And on Thursday, you're going to use it to write the steps that the family and their friends used to try to save the tree. So enjoy. Have a good week.